Kenyatta will be the first Kenyan president to speak. Everywhere around the world, the political certainties of yesterday are giving way to new insecurities, largely driven by a powerful and borderless information age. Voices that would have been judged extreme are finding their ways to the center of power and governance. And this has had both positive, but we must also acknowledge negative effects. In a time like this, we leaders must seek stability, while at the same time undertaking ambitious efforts to shape a future that responds to the need of our people. That is the challenge of governing today. And this is a challenge on every continent. To know what needs stabilizing and what must also change. Nearly 70 years ago, Harold Macmillan famously spoke of a wind of change blowing right across Africa. The time for change had come, and there was little that could be done to stand in the way of freedom and independence. We as Africans took on our independence as a chance to shape a new destiny that would build a new continent and new nations. And with it, a belief and a hope to deliver to our people health, education, peace, and stability. Kenya has grown into a democracy without a peer in our region. But that has not been without its challenges, as I'm sure the evening news here has had occasion to remind each and every one of you. We have also developed the most diverse and most vibrant economy in our region. And throughout these decades of building, reforming, and growing, the United Kingdom has been an ally as well as a business partner. We have worked together to bring peace and stability to a troubled region. We have defended freedom and democracy together from the extremists who employ terrorism to undermine our way of life. And our people have traded with one another as well as invested in each other. Our friendship is built on solid foundations and the decades of collaboration have only deepened it. To take it to new heights, however, will require more than a celebration of the past. We must also better understand the winds of change that are sweeping across our continent and indeed the world today, so that we can craft a partnership that is more fit for purpose. One that can deliver more value and more relevance for Kenyans and British citizens who are demanding that we listen to them and change with the times to serve them even better as governments, but as well as civil society. Our partnership needs to be aware of a new worldwide impatience <coughs> with a compromise, the debate, and the respect for opposing views that democracy demands. There is today a growing temptation for some in the mainstream governing parties to seek political advantage in extreme positions that erode unity, a sense of national purpose, and paint compromise as betrayal. They seek a permanently divided body politic and non-stop political campaigning at the expense of countries doing the hard work of building prosperity. I believe we need to face this tendency together. First, by understanding that positive change is difficult to enact in a climate of permanent political instability, yet knowing that stability should not in itself be an excuse 
to remain rigid and resistant to change. Mainstream politics in Kenya, in Britain, and everywhere else in the democratic world must be responsive to the needs of the people. My reaching out to the Honorable Raila Odinga and the opposition after our elections must be seen in this context and not one of opening up a new political front. We cannot achieve the social and economic needs of our people in an environment of constant political bickering. As much as political competition is an essential component of democracy, leadership on all sides of the political divide must rise above the noise and focus on the needs of the people. That is the difference, I believe, between the politics of democracy and mature democracies. Mature democracies that can rise above competitive electoral politics to issue-based politics that seek the enhancement of people's lives and the long-term peace, stability, and prosperity of our nations. Practically, what this means is that together, we must look to reinforce constructive voices that promote nonpartisan or bipartisan solutions to our pressing problems. There are too many risks we all face and too many pitfalls in today's world that we don't need as leaders to add to them with meaningless political rhetoric. The second area is to appreciate that democracy struggles to survive when it is surrounded by tyranny. Our friendship needs to respond to the enemies of democracy rather than leave the battlefield and retreat behind walls. We have indeed won victories together, disrupted and deterred multiple plots that would have killed many of our citizens. And we must continue to work together to defeat terrorist groups that threaten much of our people and our countries. Much more coordination and collaboration can be achieved but we must go even further. The violence employed by terrorists is an extension of their ideas. They daily announce their intention to destroy democracy and to usher in an age of fanaticism and religious tyranny. We can do more to fight their ideas, not only by denying them legitimacy and relevance, but by advancing together a powerful vision of why democracy is the most effective and successful way to deliver better lives for our people. And we must make it harder for the anti-democratic, hate-filled fanatics who are organized against liberty and trying to turn our citizens against one another. And for this, we in Kenya also look forward to you to use your useful positions in forums such as the United Nations, to advance a more powerful consensus beyond just condemning terrorist violence and acting against religious and ethnic hatred and exclusivity. We want to partner with you more closely in challenging social media companies to be responsive to the extremist threats aimed at Kenya as they are those targeting Europe. Because we know that this disdain for our freedom by the extremists transcends all borders. We can work together to build stronger initiatives to prevent recruitment into terrorism and to more effectively disengage and rehabilitate foreign terrorist fighters who have defected and returned home. We must also act together to equip our people to counter the threats of weaponized information, which is now perhaps the most insidious tool of the new age. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to work together for the peace and stability of countries like South Sudan and Somalia, that not only because of the problems they have, 
undermine their own ability to achieve peace, stability, and prosperity for their own people, but also act as havens to destabilize their neighboring countries. As potent a threat as terrorism is, it pales in comparison to the last measure, which is the continuing poverty and joblessness in much of Africa. As long as there's great poverty and desperation in Africa and other parts of the world, African refugees will seek entry into Europe in their millions. Your own politics will shift in response to that influx and probably, as we have seen, not necessarily for the better. This is one instance where cause and effect are inextricable. In Africa will lead to instability in Europe. As one of the many African leaders with a growing youthful population, I recognize that we must build a much stronger economy if we are to ensure that the blessings of our demographic dividend does not turn into a curse for ourselves and indeed yourselves. Our youthful population must have access to economic opportunities that lift our country and continent to greater heights and maintain our peace and unity. So as I said, the third area, therefore requiring our urgent collaboration, is in the building of prosperity that offers jobs and opportunity to our young people. There is no more powerful engine for lifting millions out of poverty than entrepreneurship and trade. London is the global center of banking and investment. It is a city that urgently seeks out more investments and opportunities as well as higher yields. Kenya and East Africa as a whole is full of energetic and ambitious young people who can build goods and services for a rapidly growing middle class and population. We need to do more to lower the cultural, bureaucratic, and communications barrier to that investment. You can do more to support British investors making bets on big opportunities in Kenya. You can make it easier for Kenyan business people to travel to the UK. You can be ambitious in crafting a trade deal with Kenya that will be a shining example to the rest of the Commonwealth and the world. And we will walk with you each step of the way. On our part as Kenya, we can do much more to lower the barriers to investment at scale. And you will have noted that we have made aggressive reforms in the ease of doing business during my first term, and I intend to do even more. Our infrastructure will be ready for investment and sharply increase trade. And there are big opportunities for the private sector to deliver solutions in my administration's Big Four plan to transform Kenya's agriculture, healthcare, manufacturing, and affordable housing. The Kenyan and British people are marked by their pragmatism. We must marry that sense of practicality to ambition, optimism, and courage to embrace a future that is already here to deliver success in the three areas that I have outlined. I look forward to the conversations and debates to come, and most of all, to the mighty works that I believe we can build together. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much.